Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this uh, Kaida seminar with Dan Roy and Jeffrey Negrea. A um, couple of words about our speakers before we get started. Um, we have an interesting and unusual setup that I'm uh, that I actually quite like. So uh, Jeff and Dan uh, are collaborators. Jeff is a PhD student at University of Toronto in the Statistical Sciences Department, and uh, Dan is his his advisor. And uh, Dan's an associate professor there at, at, uh, in statistical sciences and computer science um, at Toronto. And uh, they'll be talking about uh, their defense of uniform convergence. And I, if, I, if I'm reading the literature correctly, uh, they're defending it in part because it started taking heat due to their own work uh, earlier on. So um, I'm interested to, to hear what they have to say about this and how this all fits together with some of the earlier work. Um, yeah. Um, Take it up from there, please. <clears throat> All right, thanks very much. So yeah, we're gonna split this talk up. I'm gonna start it off and then Jeff will pick up at some point. And I have posted a link to the archive paper uh, in the chat window. All right, so we're working towards a theory of generalization and deep learning. And one of the things that makes this difficult statistically is that in deep learning practice, networks are trained with SGD to essentially zero training error, at least in vision. Uh, so one of the things that makes this uh, tricky is that it seems that neural networks so trained by SGD no longer exhibit the classical bias complexity trade-off, which is the mainstay of uh, classical statistical learning theory, at least they don't do this when the usual notions of complexity are, u are used, like say the, the uh, dimensionality inputs, the number of hidden neurons, that sort of thing. So here's the classical picture. As I give you more and more complexity, say a bigger and bigger neural network, you expect your training error to improve because we're essentially performing empirical risk minimization. Um, at the same time, I expect my test to go down, at least initially, at some point, in, in the classical story, you would expect the test error to saturate and then start picking up as you start fitting noise in the data rather than patterns. Um, so at one end here we have, at one end here we have uh, the high bias low variance regime where we're underfitting, but our generalization error is small. At the other end, we have the low bias high variance regime where uh, we are uh, overfitting. And the classical story is that we find some sort of balance between these two, and that would be, that's what a good model is. In deep learning though, we seem to be operating in a different regime. This is a picture of double descent, where at least with the respect to the ordinary notions of complexity, we instead just see this kind of uh, behavior of, uh, of, of, of test error improving as we increase nominal notions of complexity. Just struggling a little bit with the, uh, the slide advance. Okay, so yeah, so in this regime, we have we continue to have low bias, and it seems like it seems like we're past the, the we're past this uh, place where variance explodes, and maybe variance is coming down. We don't really have we have, we have a little bit of understanding and simplistic models for what's going on here, um, but the statistical picture is is far from understood, right? And where we had a good model on the left hand side, maybe we have a oops. Had, maybe we have a great model out here in, the, in this kind of uh, double second descent. So we'd like to understand this statistical, this part of the graph. All right, so we want to understand deep learning, understand its limits. Now, one of the main tools that people have brought to understanding uh, learning and statistical learning theory is uniform convergence. And the basic idea of it is this. So we, we, all, we have some learned models, say the weights uh, obtained by SGD on deep learning. And we are interested in the risks of the future performance of that learned, learned model. And we can break this down into the empirical risk, which is how well this model has performed on the training data, which is usually close to zero, plus the generalization error, which is the difference between risk and empirical risk. So this, I mean, this is this equality is sort of trivial. Uh, but the main step that people use in analyzing this decomposition, or one of the one of the key key tools that people use in understanding this key composition is to move to this upper bound where you replace the generalization error with a supremum over the generalization error of all possible models you could have learned. Um, now this class of models that you could have learned it could be uh, distribution dependent it could be distribution independent etc. And we'll discuss some of those subtleties later. 
But this general approach is, uh, is very well suited for so-called, you know, like you might say small model classes, like BC classes, and it fully characterizes learnability in such classes. And the basic question is, is the continued use of this set of tools appropriate for understanding deep learning? So what's the state of things in deep learning theory? So it remains the case that the dominant approach to studying generalization has been, and deep learning has been by uniform laws of large numbers, so uniform convergence. Uh, and these efforts usually involve two steps. So in the first step, you are defining candidate hypotheses, uh, candidate hypothesis classes. So I'll talk about these in just a minute, but uh, many approaches have conceived of organizing neural networks in terms of their norms. So uh, I, I can have two different neural networks and the class of neural networks whose norms are bounded by say some number is simpler than the class of neural networks whose norm are bounded by a larger number. And this notion, notion of simplicity uh, coheres with bounds that we have on uh, uh, bounds we have on the uh, complexity of these norm bounded classes under various notions of complexity. All right, so these two steps defining candidate hypothesis classes like notions of simplicity. And we might be interested in say norms because there is implicit regularization thought to be going on and maybe SGD is somehow controlling uh, one of the norms as it's optimizing the empirical risk. All right, and at the same time, people are seeking out tight bounds uniform bounds for these classes. Now there's several possible versions of this sort of attack that exist out there and none of them at the moment explain generalization in my view. So uh, the, the kind of simplest, most beautiful, but also kind of, uh, most pessimistic theory is that of VC dimensions. VC dimensions are neural networks are just too large and um, they lead to vacuous bounds. Now you have to be careful when you talk about VC dimension. VC dimensions actually you have to specify what class you're talking about. And, 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 uh, and so just to be precise, I'm talking about the zero one loss class. So just pure binary classification, no scale sensitivity here at all. Now VC dimension doesn't care about your, your distribution you're dealing with. Oh, just to mention like, you know, the idea that VC dimension doesn't explain neural networks. I mean, that's an idea that goes at least as far back as Bartlett in the late 90s. Um, but it's not just the distribution independence, which is killing you. So the experiments in the, this, this point infamous or uh, uh, kind of uh, seminal paper Zhang at all. The experiments there show that the Rademacher complexity of the zero one loss class is also vacuously large. Of course, Bartlett also in 99 was not advocating any longer for scale insensitive ways of measuring complexity. So in, in some sense, it's not so surprising. Um, so that moves us to say scale sensitive classes and bounds on their Rademacher complexity, but these are also vacuously large. So in the back of our, uh, so K Carolina Jugaita, Kintara Carolina Jugaita is an author also of the work we're presenting here. And, and in, the, in, the, in the appendix of our UAI paper describing how to compute non-vacuous uh, pack phase bounds for stochastic neural networks, we had a, we had a section on uh, looking, evaluating empirically uh, existing um, margin-based bounds, uh, margin-based, Rademacher-based bounds on neural networks, uh, looking particular at path norms, showing that path norms were just too large to yield non-vacuous bounds. And you could even optimize these bounds. Um, you can even optimize a path norm uh, to kind of rule out, um, rule out explanations in terms of these notions of uh, complexity. Uh, then in our own work, uh, where we've built numerically non-vacuous bounds, these have always been for stochastic neural networks that are not the same as the networks that are returned by SGD. And you know, to be completely honest, these networks are very, very underfit. They don't perform that well. Um, and it's sort of a reflection of the sorry state of numerically non-vacuous bounds that, you know, the bounds that are, the bounds that are not vacuous are generally, first of all, not for, not for deterministic networks, and they're generally uh, very underfit networks. So closing this gap is, is a, it's a big deal and there's a long line of work uh, trying to build de-randomization of, in a different sense, so uh, turning pack phase bounds into bounds on the hard classifiers, on the deterministic ones. Uh, but e these steps that people go through to turn these bounds, get rid of the kind of stochasticity in the bounds or in the, in the classifiers lead to vacuous bounds. So 
we keep running into these barriers, are we potentially missing something? And, then, and so there was this very interesting piece of work that appeared um, over a year ago, about a year ago, and it was eventually highlighted at NeurIPS this past December as the best new direction. And in this work, which immediately caught our eye, we caught our eye on day one on archive and we were all immediately working on a resolution, is uh, this work by Nagarajan and Coulter explaining that uniform convergence may be unable to explain generalization in deep learning. Of course, uh, you know, this caught our attention. Let me explain the obstruction that they raised, which is very problematic for using uniform convergence type ideas, which are actually, so all the examples I've talked about before, so DC bounds, Rademacher bounds on either zero one class classes or, or, or um, um, scale sensitive classes and also pack based bounds, all those are examples of, of uh, uh, arguments that go via uniform convergence, potentially with distribution or data dependent classes, but all of them use uniform convergence. So Nagaraj and Coulter's example is as follows. So they introduce a, a data distribution. So this is to me a binary classification task. Data are distributed on two concentric high dimensional spheres. All right, so think about two spheres, they have the same center. One is slightly wider, has a slightly larger radius than the other. And the, um, the what are the labels? The labels basically tell you which sphere you're on. So if you're on the inner sphere, you're labeled one. If you're on the outer sphere, you're labeled zero. Now this is in two dimensions. So this is very misleading this picture, because uh, actually if I sample points uniformly at random on the sphere, um, then actually uh, you're going to kind of be nowhere near another point. You're going to be pointing almost in an orthogonal direction if you, you know, if the dimension's high. So think about high dimension, think about a number of samples far less than a number of dimensions. Sorry, I'm struggling here with the, the slide advance. Okay, so this is a data set. Now, what does SGD do on this? So, th so this, you know, I'm presenting this example, it might seem toy, but this is really a distillation of what SGD actually does on this data set, on these data sets, so this, on this distribution. So what, H, what the SGD learns is a classifier that overfits locally. Um, so if you run SGD on this example, what you'll find is that it, Let's see, there you go. Nearly learns their perfect classifier. The perfect classifier would, you know, I mean, as many perfect classifiers, but like, you know, this a, a concentric circle that, uh, you know, a barrier that, um, a decision boundary that's between these two concentric, uh, concentric spheres would be perfect. Okay, it could wobble too, but what's, what, there's actually defects here. So around every training example, the decision boundary actually creeps too far away from the example. And so you can imagine that actually there's a doppelganger data set, I'll call it, uh, what did I call it? Once my slides wake up, uh, we called it S bar. There's an, there's an equiprobable data set. It's adversarial, it's called S bar. And all we do to obtain S bar is we flip the, where the, the data point lives. So whenever the data set had a point that lived on the outside of the sphere and was labeled zero, we're gonna swap it and move it and consider the, consider the um, stop doppelganger where it's uh, the opposite. All right, so now we have this, uh, I think that's pink or some other color. So this data set's S bar and S bar, while H hat does perfectly on S, H hat just totally sinks on S bar. It gets every single example raw. And this is what you find in practice. And then by symmetry, what you find, what you realize is that actually there is a um, adversarial hypothesis called check H. And check H does terribly on the original data set at S. And so that, with them, and you can actually, so, you know, this is an argument that um, you can lift and make it high probability and all these fancy things. But what it's basically telling you at the high level is that the existence of these adversarial hypotheses, which are empirically there, implies that there's no chance of defining a class of hypotheses that contains the learned classifier with high probability and um, uh, where the generalization error is going to be any, anything other than factuously large. So this simple example sort of kills the hope for a, um, for, the, for there being a class which contains your learned model and exhibits small generalization error uniformly. All right, so that's what Nagaraj and Culver did. So it seems like uniform convergence is dead. So that, that, that's the state of things. I'll hand it over now to Jeff. Hi. Um, so I'm gonna pick up where he left off and as I hope you guessed, because we're saying in defense of uniform convergence, that's actually not the end of the story. Uh, so our work on def uh, in defense of uniform convergence uh, looks to figure out how uniform convergence may yet be used. So 
in the same paper uh, where they show those examples, uh, Nagarajan and Coulter make the following conjecture. They conjecture that SGD finds a fit that's simple at a macroscopic level, and so it leads to good generalization. But it also has many microscopic fluctuations which hurt uniform convergence. And so the way we can think of that in the previous picture is it was close to, the, uh, to a central concentric sphere in most of the angular directions. It's just where those tiny little bumps were that went outside of the uh, two concentric spheres that were problematic. And so it was simple in most places, but it had these microscopic fluctuations which destroyed any chance of uniform convergence. So that work doesn't show us how, if true, we can exploit the uh, actual structure of the things that we, we learn in order to analyze the generalization error. So what we do is we demonstrate that one may yet exploit uniform convergence even if the conjecture is true. So if the conjecture is true, uh, comparing our learned hypothesis H hat with a partly de-randomized version of itself will be useful. And the de-randomized version may belong to a class with uniform convergence. And the de-randomized version could be designed to smooth out these microscopic fluctuations. So intuitively, if we forgot the exact angular direction where this microscopic fluctuation occurred, then we wouldn't be assigning so much generalization error to uh, because of the existence of these adversarial hypotheses. And again, if the um, microscopic fluctuations are small and it's good at a macroscopic level, then we won't need to alter our learned hypothesis too much. And so the risk properties of a de-randomized version and the original version should be similar. So kind of the overarching goal here is going to be able to be to try and find a de-randomized version of the thing that we learn, which does have uniform convergence and is somehow similar to uh, the thing that we've learned. So again, roadblocks are arising in using uniform convergence to explain the performance of our complex models. And so we're describing a new role that uniform bounds may play. And so the way we're going to proceed and how we're going to kind of get meaningful results is first we have to actually say what we mean uh, when we say that uniform convergence fails. So in deep learning practice, you're not fitting the same model when you have 10,000 examples as when you have 10 million examples. Your model is getting more complex uh, with your sample size. And it's the same thing in those examples by Nagarajan and Coulter. Uh, if you had a 10,000 dimensional sphere, there is a number of data points that'll be sufficiently large that uh, the like VC properties of these two concentric spheres kick in, but their examples are kind of built on the premise that you're increasing the dimensionality of your, of your parameter space at the same time as you're increasing your sample size. And so we need new notions of uniform convergence that make sense in that context. And then we're going to introduce the uh, study of the generalization error of our learned hypothesis H hat uh, from our hypothesis class H in terms of a de-randomized surrogate hypothesis. And so we're going to design surrogates to live in a class with uniform convergence, and we're going to combine the uniform convergence of the surrogate and some approximation results to explain the performance of our actual learned hypothesis. And we're going to use this method to explain benign overfitting in very overparametrized linear regression. So the dimension is much larger than the number of samples, uh, linear regression. And we're going to do this by introducing a very particular de-randomized surrogate, which mimics uh, the state of the art analysis for this problem. And then we're going to show how uh, de-randomized surrogates can be constructed for a generic learning problem. And that's going to be with probabilistic conditioning. So we're going to actually create surrogates that themselves are random predictors. Then finally, we're going to explain generalization in uh, examples like the, the cartoon we showed you just a moment ago. Uh, and we're going to explain them using surrogates constructed by conditioning. So uh, going back to the first thing I told you we're, we're going to do, uh, we need to compare kind of modern practice versus classical learning theory. So in modern machine learning, as we get more data, we're building larger and more complex models. And classic learning theory only tells us really what happens if uh, 
you use the same model no matter what your sample size is. So if you have a hundred, a thousand, or a million data points, you're using the same model class. But modern practice doesn't do this. Modern practice has one model class when you have a hundred points, and a bigger one when you have a thousand points, and a bigger one still when you have a million points. So we need a new notion of uniform convergence for when the complexity is growing with the sample size. To this end, we introduce the notion of a structural blavenko kentelli class. And it focuses on uniform convergence for sequences of problems of varying complexity. Uh, you can think of the agnostic pack learnable framework, if you're familiar with that terminology, as a variant of the classical blavenko kentelli property. Whereas non-uniform learning would not be a, a variant of the classic blavenko kentelli property. So structural blavenko kentelli uh, kind of encompasses both uh, pack and non-uniform learning. And uh, a visualization of kind of why we need this is uh, what the classic blavenko kentelli property tells you is that uh, for a fixed model class, uh, as the sample size increases, your generalization error will go down. And you might have a given training error for a, a particular model class. And you can expand your model class and as you make your model class bigger, it'll take longer, uh, it'll take more and more samples for the generalization error to come down. And uh, your training error will increase more slowly and maybe level off somewhere lower. And you could get a bigger model still where the generalization error decreases even slower and you have even lower uh, like asymptotic training error in the sample size. But what we're really gonna do is we're going to have uh, each sample size, a different model that we pick. So with N1 samples, we might use model one. And with N2 samples, we might use model two. And with N3 samples, we might use model three. And kind of a good, a good thing to look for is that you want both the generalization error to come down as you progress through the sequence of models and increase your sample size. And you want your training error to come down too. So the classical glavenko kentelli property, or kind of the, the standard notion of uniform convergence, can be expressed by this formula. A hypothesis class H has the classic glavenko kentelli property with respect to a distribution uh, for your data D. If uh, the generalization error, which is this term here, the generalization error of the hypothesis H uh, uniformly over our hypothesis class capital H, is uh, vanishing in expectation. So asymptotically, as the sample size goes to infinity, you're estimating the, the risk of every hypothesis in your hypothesis class uh, arbitrarily accurately using your training data is one way to think about this. So now we're gonna have a sequence of learning problems uh, indexed by a, a symbol P. So for each learning problem in our sequence, we'll have a different hypothesis class. And the sequence of learning problems with these hypothesis classes will have the structural blavenko kentelli property with respect to the sequence of distributions D and the sequence of sample sizes N. If almost the same equation holds, but now we don't have the same distribution for every, uh, for every instance in our sequence of problems, uh, we have a different distribution, a different sample size, and a different hypothesis class at each instance. And so this allows us to consider hypothesis classes which get larger and learning problems which get more complicated. So when we say the uniform convergence uh, fails for a sequence of learning problems, what we mean is that the sequence of hypothesis classes that we could have learned does not have the structural blavenko kentelli property. And this is the type of failure that's exhibited in the examples of Nagarajan and Coulter. So what we want to do is relate the generalization error for problems where the structural blavenko kentelli property fails to problems where it holds. And the new problem we introduce, we're gonna call it a surrogate. And so we're going to relate the uh, generalization error for these two problems by partitioning the generalization error of our learned hypothesis for our original problem, which is h hat into parts, representing the error from approximation by the surrogate and the generalization error of the surrogate. So our uh, surrogate hypotheses have to live in some class. So let G be a second hypothesis class and 
if we're thinking about learning problems that come with a loss function that we want to optimize, uh, we need to be able to extend our loss function to this second hypothesis class. So assume that that all uh, works. Then we can write down the surrogate decomposition uh, for our learned hypothesis h hat in terms of a learned hypothesis g hat from g. And it's just this trivial bit of arithmetic. Uh, and it says that we can partition the generalization error of the learned hypothesis h hat into three parts. The middle part is the generalization error of the surrogate. So we're no longer going to aim to have h have uniform convergence. We're going to instead aim for g hat to have uh, to be in a uniform convergence class or an SGC class. And then we have these two approximation error terms. One is the difference of the true risks between uh, h hat and g. And what is the difference between the empirical risks of h hat and g? And notice that the signs on these are different. So you have uh, the risk of h hat minus the risk of g and the uh, empirical risk of g hat minus the empirical risk of h hat. So we think of g hat as a de-randomized version of h hat. And uh, the reason that we call it a de-randomized version is uh, when we want to replace this term with a supremum, the more randomness there is in this term, the more things uh, that there could have been inside that supremum. And the larger the class you take the supremum over, the larger that supremum will be. So if we want this to be small, we need essentially uh, the class that contains g hat to be less complicated. Uh, and, and we refer to this as uh, g hat having been de-randomized. So globally, uh, g hat should look like h hat, and locally, it should smooth out where h hat had overfit to the data. And so in the picture that we had before, we might hope for something like the gold decision boundary. So maybe our g hat still overfits a little bit, but it doesn't do so enough uh, to kind of to break, essentially. So if we de-randomize them enough, our surrogate hypothesis may yet belong to a class with uniform convergence. And if we de-randomize too much, uh, these two approximation error terms might become very large. And so uh, the learned hypothesis h hat may have risk properties very different from its surrogate g hat. And so this kind of creates a tension that we have to aim to balance. Uh, we don't want to de-randomize too much, but we need to de-randomize enough to still have uniform convergence, at least with this attack on uh, analyzing the problem. So the first example to which we're going to apply this idea is uh, benign overfitting in linear regression. So there was this paper uh, by Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Siegler where they look at uh, very high dimensional linear regression. So we're looking at a slightly simplified version of the problem that they consider. We have a response y and predictors x that are linearly related by a linear predictor beta and there's some residual noise epsilon. And we're going to assume that the design matrix for the linear regression is Gaussian, and that the number of dimensions far exceeds the number of observations. We're going to work with the squared error loss. And our learning algorithm is going to be something very specific. It's going to output the minimum norm empirical risk minimizer, which is given by this least squares formula. It looks like the usual linear regression formula, but with an inverse replaced with a pseudo inverse. And so among all of the different uh, linear predictors that interpolate the, the pair of xy's, uh, beta hat is the one which has the smallest norm. So Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Siegler so that when the sequence of design covariance matrices has certain property that they coined the term benign to describe, uh, then the, the minimum norm ERM has a risk that converges to the Bayes risk as the sample size increases. So as the sample size tends to infinity. What we prove uh, first is that any sequence of hypothesis classes that contain this learned hypothesis with probability two thirds cannot be structural Glavenko Kentalic. So in combination with the work of uh, Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Siegler, this kind of shows us that this example is in the camp that we're really working to describe. The algorithm minimum norm ERM works, at least uh, when the sequence of design covariances is benign, yet uniform convergence absolutely fails to describe its success. 
And so the good performance of beta hat is not explained by uniform convergence of any class that we could possibly conceive that contains beta hat. So those authors, uh, they show that they, they prove the risk consistency of the minimum norm ERM using something called the bias variance decomposition, which is kind of a standard approach to linear regression problems. And we find that it's actually the same in expectation as the surrogate decomposition we described above. And in particular, we need to pick a surrogate that fits to the data without the response noise. So uh, you have this surrogate learned hypothesis, which is beta hat naught. Uh, it essentially solves the least squares problem, but instead of y, we replace it with x beta. So obviously in real life, we would never be able to fit the model beta hat naught but uh, we don't need to fit the model beta hat not. It's just a conceptual tool in order to uh, reason about the generalization error. So it's purely a, like an intermediate step in a proof. But this type of surrogate uh, beta hat not constructed using this formula is constrained to a compact set because if you notice uh, this formula, it's just the projection of beta onto the columns of X. And so it lives on in, in 2D, uh, it's a circle in higher dimensions. It's not a sphere, but it's a simple compact manifold. Um, but it, it's, a, it's very small. It's much smaller than the kind of set of all possible beta hats we could have had originally. And obviously this beta hat not really contains the key information that relates X to Y because we actually got rid of everything that was kind of distorting that relationship in the first place. So the corresponding terms of each of the two decompositions, uh, bias variance decomposition and surrogate decomposition, are that the bias term of the bias variance decomposition corresponds to the generalization error of the surrogate. The variance term of the bias variance decomposition corresponds to the risk difference. And the irreducible error that you would find in the bias variance decomposition uh, corresponds to the excess empirical risk, at least all in expectation. And so using this information, uh, we show two things. First, we show that the surrogate hypothesis we've introduced, beta hat naught, uh, does live in a uniform convergence class. So we have actually this quantitative bound that tells us how quickly uh, the, the expected supremum of the difference of losses goes to zero. And we also show uh, that this gives us risk consistency. And actually, uh, this approach based on uniform convergence of the surrogate allowed us to tighten the bound uh, that Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Siegler had. So in their paper, they had a necessary condition uh, for risk consistency, and they had a sufficient condition for risk consistency, and they had a gap that the necessary condition was not the same as the sufficient condition. And by looking at the same problem through the lens of uniform convergence of a surrogate, we were actually able to close that gap and so this weakly benign condition is essentially uh, the same as the necessary condition shown by Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Siegler. So in fact, this condition is essentially tight for when risk consistency occurs. So this kind of begs the question of how can we find useful surrogates? So we saw that a surrogate can be useful in improving our understanding of a learning task. But the example of a surrogate uh, based on, on over-parametrized linear regression was bespoke to that task. We really like took advantage of properties of projection matrices and stuff like that in order to, to get this to work. So an obvious question is whether there exist general recipes to define surrogates without relying on special structure or simple structure of a particular task. And the answer is yes. Uh, we're able to construct uh, surrogates for very generic learning problems via, uh, by, by letting our surrogates be randomized predictors and then constructing them by probabilistic conditioning. And so we'll, we'll take a look at what that means. So first let's talk about what randomized predictors are. If we have a hypothesis class or a collection of predictor, predictors H, uh, then let M1 of H be the space of all probability distributions on the set of predictors. So a randomized predictor, you can think of it as uh, like a, a you, you flip a special coin that tells you which predictor to use and then you make a prediction according to that predictor. 
So if we have a randomized predictor uh, Q, which is one of these measures on the space of all possible predictors, then uh, we can define the average risk of the predictor Q uh, just as the expected risk of the random hypothesis that you happen to draw. So the hypothesis is like an H-valued random element, and then this is uh, a random variable, which is the risk of that random element. And so it has an expectation, and we define the risk of Q, so we've lifted the risk function to M1 of H using this definition. And similarly, we can define the empirical average risk of a randomized predictor. And we're going to be picking our surrogate class G to be some subcollection of the space of measures on H. And um, similarly to how the risk was extended to Q, we can extend losses to Q. Uh, and obviously, uh, this type of extension of the loss function will match the extension of the risk function that I described. So now let's talk about derandomization via conditioning. So since derandomized surrogates can be useful, we want to construct them from a, for a generic uh, learned hypothesis. And we're going to kind of do this first intuitively based on the example we saw, and then we'll write down kind of a more general formula for what it means. But in the example on over-parametrized linear regression, we nullified the noise, but instead of nullifying the response noise, we could have redrawn it independently from the same distribution. So maybe we would generate beta hat prime, uh, which looks like the same formula as beta hat, but the true response noise was replaced by an independent copy of the response noise. Similarly to beta hat naught that we saw before, uh, we, we couldn't actually construct this in practice, but it's still a useful analytic tool in understanding the generalization error. So we notice now that beta hat and beta hat prime have a common conditional distribution given the data x, given the covariates x. So we're gonna denote that conditional distribution by P superscript X of beta hat prime or beta hat. And so these conditional distributions, they're random measures because they depend on what the value of X was. So they're random probability distributions. Um, and they're the, they're, they are the conditional distribution of beta hat given X. And the key insight is that this random uh, measure can be used as our surrogate. So beta hat is a, a hypothesis. So if we draw beta hat uh, prime from this conditional distribution, which is what this recipe or this formula here tells us to do, then we kind of fit the bill of the randomized predictors that we saw on the slide before. And so the conditional law of beta hat given x can be our surrogate. And so we think of beta hat uh, the law of beta hat given x as the randomized predictor that redraws beta hat prime uh, conditionally on x for every new test instance. And more generally, for any possible learned hypothesis that we could have and any sigma field f or any collection of random variables that we've summarized in f, then we can construct the random measure, the random randomized classifier q, as the conditional law of h hat given f. And this is a surrogate which is coupled to the original learned hypothesis only through the information contained in F. So you can think of F as a collection of random variables that you're going to condition on. And the key, uh, the key that makes this kind of like a, an especially useful surrogate to introduce is that because of the tower rule of uh, conditional expectations, that for any sigma field or any collection of random variables that we want to condition on, uh, the, the approximation due to the true risks uh, gives zero error. So the true risk of the learned hypothesis and expectation will always be equal to the true risk of this surrogate that we've constructed by conditioning, no matter what we're conditioning on. So this lets us kind of simplify our surrogate decomposition. When once we had three terms, now we have only two. And those two terms can be described quite simply. The first one, again, is the generalization error of Q. And the first one is the excess empirical risk of Q. And in the case where H hat interpolates the data almost surely, so it is, achieves uh, zero empirical risk, this term disappears. And the uh, decomposition is just the uh, empirical risk of Q plus the generalization error of Q. Uh, 
And so if h hat overfits the data, we might expect uh, q or pf of h to have a higher empirical risk and a lower generalization error. And we can kind of think of the whole spectrum of possible things we could condition on. At the left side of this diagram, we're not conditioning on anything. On the right side, we're conditioning on everything. And there's a plethora of combinations of things that we could have conditioned on in between, which I've represented as a lattice because you could think of uh, it being represented by like collections of random variables with subset. So now on the left side of this, if we condition on nothing, then uh, our surrogate hypothesis h hat prime drawn according to q will just be an independent copy of h hat. So it won't depend on the training data that we've actually seen at all. And at the far right extreme of this, when we condition on everything, then h hat will just be uh, drawn from a point mass, h hat prime will be drawn from a point mass on h hat, or it'll be equal to h hat all the time. And that means that if we've conditioned on everything, then we've not really uh, de-randomized at all. And if we condition on something that's more than nothing, but less than everything, uh, we'll get something in between. And the, the story here is that as we move from conditioning on nothing towards conditioning on everything, then we're going to increase the generalization error and decrease the empirical risk. And the intuitive uh, explanation as to why that's the case is at this extreme, there's only one uh, unconditional law of the learned hypothesis. And so there's only one element in our surrogate hypothesis class uh, when we've conditioned on nothing. And so any class that contains Q uh, could have just been the singleton class containing this. And so any singleton class will have uniform convergence. And at the opposite extreme, uh, the classes containing H hat are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the classes containing delta of H hat. And so um, here, the, we've not kind of, we've not gained anything from de-randomizing uh, by not de-randomizing, essentially. And so we've split the true risk, uh, sorry, the true generalization error of H hat into these two terms. And so as we move from left to right, we are uh, decreasing this term and increasing this term. And so we have this sort of trade-off where we might want to balance the left term with the right term. And we can think of uh, what different choices of F will mean for what our, D our random classifier, uh, the conditional law of H hat given F mean by what they do to new test points. So if we condition on the full sigma field, uh, then we're just going to use the original training data set in the original model and it corresponds to no de-randomization. Whereas if we condition on the trivial sigma field, it means that we're redrawing the whole training data set and refitting the model every time we have a new test point. So those were the two extremes on that lattice I showed you before, but here are some things that are in between. If we condition on all the covariates, but none of the responses, then we're gonna redraw the responses given uh, the covariates for every example and refit the model. And we'll do this kind of independently every time we're given a test point. Or if we condition on sigma y, uh, then we're gonna redraw the covariates given the responses for all examples and refit the model. Uh, and that's again for every test point. So it's kind of dual to, to three. And the one that we're actually going to use in an example coming up is that we're going to, uh, Kind of, we're gonna condition on some subset of the features and we're going to then, uh, for every test point, we're gonna be redrawing a subset of the features uh, independently and refitting the model. And sorry, we, we're gonna redraw the, the complementary subset of the features and the responses given the features that we've conditioned on and then refit the model and, um, and do that independently for every test point. And intuitively, you could think of, imagine you threw away the bottom half of all of your images, uh, then this surrogate hypothesis would, would represent uh, redrawing the bottom half of images in an image data set and relabeling those images uh, and retraining the entire neural network that you have under consideration every time you get a new test point. So again, it's obviously not something you could hope to do in practice, but again, it's just an analytic tool that we use to understand our algorithms better. 
So for any given learning problem, some of these will be more useful than others. And obviously your mileage will vary. Uh, maybe three is useful for, or something akin to three is useful for the linear regression problem. And something akin to five is useful in the example we'll see coming up. So uh, the example that we're gonna consider is inspired by uh, the concentric spheres of Nagarajan and Coulter. And I'm gonna use the pictures uh, based on that example, even though it's not exactly the example that's in our paper. So what we do is we construct a combinatorial example that distills the key features of the Nagarajan and Coulter work and has uh, learned hypotheses interpolating our training data set and overfitting in the same very localized way. And so it'll have a low generalization error just because this overfitting only occurs very locally. And we prove using the same sort of argument of an antipodal data set that uh, the learned hypothesis cannot belong to any structural plavenko cantelli class. And indeed, uh, that's true even with high probability. In fact, the VC dimension of any class containing our learned hypothesis almost surely will be the same as the sample size. We then show that a surrogate constructed by conditioning on a subset of the features and what this looks like kind of um, in, in this cartoon maybe, is that we're going to redraw uh, or, or recomplete our data set. Uh, maybe one completion is S1 prime and it's kind of rotated all of our data points to the right here. And we would have learned, um, we would have maybe for this draw of our completion, we would have uh, drawn this or we would have learned this other hypothesis H1 hat which didn't overfit in exactly the same way as our original learned hypothesis. And we could have drawn this other uh, completion of the data set with its corresponding learned hypothesis, which overfit also, but in some slightly different sort of way. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna spread, um, it's gonna spread out the kind of egregious overfitting over a wide range of points. And so, you're not going to pay for any particular antipodal data set fully because you're only gonna pay for it with kind of small probability that you've recovered that exact antipodal data set. And so these uh, um, antithetical hypotheses don't exist anymore. And so because of, because of that mouthful, which I'm sure was incomprehensible, uh, our surrogate hypothesis belongs to a structural glavenko cantelli class and the generalization error will decrease with the amount of derandomization as uh, we kind of intuitively explained before. And the excess empirical risk will increase with the amount of derandomization. And we're gonna find that we're able to obtain useful generalization bounds sort of somewhere in between. So when we don't condition on everything, but we condition on something. Uh, and so here you can think of the proportion of the uh, features that we're gonna condition on. And first thing we find is that uh, there's a quick drop in the generalization error bounds that we're able to prove using this method uh, as we increase the proportion of derandomization so that we've got highly uh, non-vacuous bounds after possibly a small amount of derandomization. And we also find that as the dimension of the problem becomes larger and larger, the amount of derandomization that we need decreases. So here at this curve, uh, had 256 dimensions, whereas this one only had 16 dimensions. And so in exactly the scenario uh, where these problems are cropping up is, uh, is where this, this tool is kind of providing the most benefit, which is interesting and kind of promising, we think. So just to conclude, uh, we saw how roadblocks arise in using uniform convergence to explain performance of complex models. And we saw a new role that uniform bounds play uh, via de-randomization in surrogates. And the key idea is to relate the learned model to a de-randomized surrogate model. And the surrogate will hopefully belong to a uniform convergence class, even if the learned hypothesis that we actually care about doesn't. And the surrogates can be constructed via probabilistic conditioning for very generic problems. And we saw two examples where uniform convergence failed for the learned model one based on over-parametrized linear regression and one inspired by the work of Nagarajan and Coulter. And for both of these examples, a de-randomized surrogate improved our understanding of learning algorithms. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Dan, for that. Um, if anyone has any questions, we've got plenty of time. So um, I guess the um, uh, best way is probably raise your hand, or I guess you can type in the chat, chat window. Um, we can, I think we should just have a free for all. <laughs> or a free for all. <laughs> I have a question if no one else wants to jump in here. Um, okay, so I guess in the in the example that that you went through in detail, the Nagarajan and, and Coulter example, um, the, it seemed like the derandomization part, so the part that you conditioned on, uh, reflected some of the symmetry of the model, right? So you were conditioning on the radius of each of the classes, um, and then using the rotational invariance of the problem. Is that important, or is that just an artifact of, of the example? It's actually more an artifact of my cartoon of the example because in the actual so the actual example that we have is not two concentric spheres it's corners of a hypercube and then it's kind of majority vote uh for whether a point is labeled zero or one uh based on whether the like corner was at a zero or at a one mm -hmm. uh, so that's the true data distribution in the in the real example that's in the paper just kind of harder to draw and less uh intuitive i guess but then um what we were forgetting is whether it was a zero or a one there. And so it wasn't like just rotating a little bit like this. It, it didn't keep it on the same sphere, but there was, um, I guess, some memory of like, if you had a lot of zeros in the part that you uh, condition on, then you're more likely still to see a zero. Um, I'm not sure if that actually answers your question, but essentially we didn't exploit the structure in such an obvious way as just rotating slightly left or right. Okay. So I think, well, in that second, in the latter example, it seems like there's some sort of sufficient statistic going on there with the number of zeros. Um, is that, and okay, symmetry and sufficiency are, yeah. are, are intimately related. Is there, I mean, yeah, we probably could have we probably could have conditioned on the sufficient statistic and then that would have which is almost which is almost a label yeah the sufficient right? statistic dictates the label is it deter the label is a deterministic function of it yeah i think yeah so yeah yeah we could have i mean for analysis it was important i think to re sample the label at least it simplified things but we could have i mean something that we're on the lookout for because you can de-randomize at any level you like. The decomposition is an equality, the tautology. Mm -hmm. So really it's, it's what sort of analysis it affords you, right? And so the analysis that, that was carried out in the Nagarajan and Kolder case was like deliberately as coarse as possible to illustrate you know, how uh, choosing a particular de-randomization and being, uh, can kind of give you some um, kind of uh, uh, purchase on analyzing things. So a, a, a slightly more refined question is, uh, is there a generic way to de to de-randomize? And then maybe from an information theoretic perspective, like how much do I need to de-randomize before I regain uniform convergence? Because there's nothing that says that you should be able to explain, um, there's nothing that says you should be able to explain, uh, well, it, 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 it's subtle, but you know, there's a question like how, at least the question I'm interested in is how much, how much do you need to de-randomize information theoretically before uniform convergence kicks in? And then the examples in the, maybe you can go back a slide, Jeff, in the, in the, in the graph here, you see that once the dimension gets sufficiently high, uh, you barely need to de-randomize at all. So the proportion of features that you need to throw away is approaching zero here. And you, you go to almost like a phase change before uniform convergence error goes to zero. So what 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 is there a generic way to de-randomize? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with sufficient statistics or something like that. And whether that gave one kind of some analytical leg up in understanding generalization in a complicated scenario like deep learning, well, that has yet to be seen. I'd say. 
I think it's an interesting line of work to think about more for sure to to see if we can just condition what happens at least in this framework if we condition on sufficient statistics and if does everything just become like obvious after that you have to write it down and see well presumably the example would be simple enough that you could that yeah. the, the sufficient statistics that uh, I mean okay, so you sort of be setting yourself up for success I guess in practice the question is yeah of all of the possible sub sigma fields you could condition on is there a notion of optimality i guess that's exactly what what dan was talking about but <clears throat> yeah um okay i think mark did i see your camera on for a second there hey yeah um i'm just wondering if you can make some comments on like the effect of the algorithm in choosing local optima and, and how you think that fits in here So uh, for one of the examples, the linear regression, we were actually only analyzing a specific algorithm, which was minimum norm ERF. Um, and in this example, also, we were analyzing a specific algorithm. So actually, in, in all of these examples, we can't, we haven't said anything about uh, whether a generic ERM for, uh, would do well. We've only been able to say that the ERMs that we've looked at specifically can do well. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say like, so thinking about deep learning, right? So a major challenge for say building pack-based bounds or norm-based norm bounds on uh, for deep learning is that there's quite a bit of stochasticity in which uh, basin you land in. Um, now the notion of basin is a little bit vague. So let me talk about like, I'll call a basin uh, one where like, um, so two points are like in the same basin if you can draw a line between them and the empirical risk does not, or the, the loss does not go up when you go between these two weight solutions. Um, so it's like a convex sublevel set. Uh, so, you know, so I know empirically, like so some, we, some we study and related to the lottery ticket hypothesis is like this onset of linear mode connectivity where at some point in the optimization, not too far along, like say 10% through training, the, uh, the linearly connected mode that you land in is like now fixed and the randomness inside SGD is no longer relevant, right? So you could potentially try to um, you could potentially try to de-randomize in that part, treating this, this kind of second 90% of SGD as like basically choosing where in this linearly connected mode you land. Um, meaning that you don't have to pay for all the random, almost irrelevant choices you make when you kind of choose where to land in this uh, linearly connected mode potentially. Or maybe you want to de-randomize the, or maybe you want to, um, um, yeah. Like, anyways, that's like that's an idea. So, specifically with respect to SGD, we were exactly thinking about um, how derandomization might allow us to not pay for the effective noise on the final weights. And are there any final questions? Last chance. Oh, there's a hand. Oh, uh, boy on. Uh, go for it. <clears throat> oh, boy on. Are you there? Maybe, maybe uh, they're typing. <laughs> Mike. Uh -oh. <laughs> Wait, if you can, if you can type your question in the chat window, we can, we can pick it up there. <clears throat> 
Um, could you clarify what you mean by online, uh, Boyan? Uh, so Boyan asked, uh, could you incorporate information about the learning algorithm online, as in moving along the uh, lattice of conditionings? Um, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest. Um, Dan, do you have I mean, any I, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, for, for what, me, one thing to mention is that, of course, like the, um, uh, you could, you know, for SG, nothing says that. So all the sigma algebras we talked about were sigma algebras generated by looking at the data set or subsets of the data set. But that's not necessary. So, for example, in SGD, you could look at the sequence of weights um, or that, the iterates of SGD. And so you could condition on some uh, statistics or whatever, uh, coarsening or something of that trajectory. So you could you condition you could, on what basin you land in uh, once you yeah. find it. That's right. You could condition on the base and you land in. All right. Anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of creativity here in terms of understanding, uh, in terms of what, uh, what sigma algebra you define. Um, and of course, like, you know, to, to, to reason about these is maybe gets a little bit complicated. Uh, but I would like to offer the idea that, you know, you might initially just constrain yourself to, Hey, which of these sigma algebras can I uh, simulate from potentially uh, or approximately simulate from? So that's something that we're interested in too. And another thing, which is not usually done so much in theory, is to um, use, you know, if you have a data set like MNIST, no one says you have to analyze your theory on all 60,000 examples. You can split those up, build generalization bounds for 30,000, and use the other 30,000 to estimate distributional properties of, of the data set, potentially. Now, this doesn't make sense if you're doing model selection or designing learning algorithms because you don't have free data lying around. But if you want to understand what's going on with SGD, SGD's performance is for sure distribution dependent. Um, and so you may, you will, you will need to rely upon certain properties of the distribution. So you could you know, potentially isolate those and use estimation, use statistical techniques to improve your understanding. Yeah, so you could absolutely, you can absolutely use algorithmic conditions to define your your, your, your lattice. And gen generally speaking, the value is gonna be one point in the lattice. Like for example, you could you know, define the conditioning to be like uh, some kind of envelope of the optimization trajectory. The final basin is just suggested. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the point of kind of posing it in terms of like an arbitrary sigma fill that we condition on is that we didn't want to pin ourselves down to conditioning on features of the data set. Uh, so, so something about the like randomness of our algorithm could also be something interesting to condition on. So our, our main goal is not to represent the conditional distribution, uh, at least with this work. We weren't trying to um, simulate from the conditional distribution. I tried to highlight during uh, the talk um, that typically these surrogates are not something that we're going to simulate or, or fit in practice. They're something that we're just introducing in order to get a handle on the analysis of the thing we actually care about. Um, so I would not say uh, that that UC is not just the, is the not really the thing that we care about and that like uh, res representable disintegrations are uh, having a representable disintegration might be a way to get to a um, an understanding of a particular surrogate if we wanted to actually analyze it empirically instead of analytically, uh, but it's not like a necessary requirement and. Uh, typically, I think in the examples, we won't have good representations of the disintegration or good uh, ways to sample from our surrogate. Okay, I think that's uh, probably all we have time for. Um, thanks again to Dan and Jeff for, for the great talk. And uh, Aaron, I don't know if you have any announcements uh, for upcoming seminars or anything.
Um, we have, it's a couple weeks till our next seminar, so watch our website. And if you have not registered for our industry event, uh, please do so. You can find all that on our website. And um, thank you so much to Jeff and Dan. Let's give them one more virtual round of applause. Thank you all for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ben, for hosting. Sure, no problem. Thank you everyone for coming.